Greetings from Berkeley, California, everybody. I am Christian Kreivik. I work at Corelight, uh, where I spend most of my time working on uh, open source Zeek nowadays. And uh, today, together with my colleague, um, Vlad Grigorescu at uh, ESNet, we're going to be talking about packaging Zeek's policy scripts with better ZKG templating. And the plan here is that basically I will cover the first line and Vlad is going to cover the second line and we'll switch over in about midway through the um, presentation. So for a bit of background, um, if you're at all familiar with the Zeek distribution, you probably know that there are two big directories in it in which we store policy scripts. So the first one is script space, which features the core functionality of Zeek, which is quite large. There are about 270 scripts in there and is essentially always loaded unless you use bare mode. Um, and you can see all that stuff being pulled in from a file called base in a default.zeek, which is actually sort of hardwired into the code base. And the other big location that we have is scripts policy, which is a bunch of optional functionality that is significantly smaller. It's about 110 files um, that is sort of partially loaded and governed by a file called site local.zeek, which we install um, sort of as a suggestion. And then in future updates, basically don't go near. And so that's a file that's essentially up to the maintainer in terms of you know, the content. And if you've used Zeek, you know, in a reasonably modern fashion lately at all, then you've also heard of ZKG, our package manager, which has been out there for about three years or so, um, which is pretty full featured and sort of much like, you know, package managers that you might know from other ecosystems like Python or Ruby and so forth. And so it features a bunch of things like, you know, its own repositories, we call them package sources. There's a there's a standard packet source for the uh, Zeek ecosystem. If you search versioning dependencies, Zeek plugins can be parts of packages. Really pretty cool. It's currently a, a standalone project. Um, it's installable via pip, so it's all built in Python. And it actually features its own Python module. So if you wanted to build different you know, features or front ends or something on top of it, then you can do that. Um, there is one key difference that's always worth flagging when you compare it to other package managers, and it is that it is essentially stateful. So it is uh, unlike other package managers in that you can install a package, but then still decide whether you want to load or unload a package. And that's a feature we'll be talking about a little bit um, a couple minutes down the road. So the way this looks right now, which you know many of you will be familiar with, is that there's this file local.zeek that I just mentioned, where you basically just have lines in there that, that selectively pull in functionality from the policy folder. And it's literally just at load statements that pull in certain things. And if you change your mind about what you need in your installation, you just go in there and you know you, you change the lines a little bit. So basically you, you edit that file and you restart your cluster. <clears throat> so the policy folder in that way is sort of nice in that it's very simple and straightforward, but it has a couple of drawbacks. So the, the, the biggest probably is that it just slows down innovation. So we, we, we sort of hardwire all this stuff into the Zeek distribution, and therefore we can also only change it whenever we update the Zeek distribution. So that's not so great. Um, the whole model is sort of outdated because today innovation in the scripting layer is supposed to happen in Zeek packages. And so this, 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 this big sort of set of scripts that just sits there in policy is just not very sort of up to stuff. And if you've ever actually used CKG, this whole idea of like going into like local.zeek and, and editing lines feels a little bit just, yeah, sort of outdated. So it seems pretty clear that, you know, you can probably guess where I'm going. So the goal that we have here is we really would like to package up the policy folder. So the contents in there, migrate them over to CKG sort of incrementally over time um, to make this stuff more modern and uh, just sort of you know, allow more quick iteration on all of this stuff. So this idea has been out there for a while. There's you know, a GitHub issue on it. There's a bunch of good discussion on it. Um, but before we started sort of prototyping a little bit, we thought, OK, let's see how feasible this actually is. And so looking at policy a little bit, OK, so it's 7,500 7, um, lines, 7,500 lines of code, about 110 files, 30 folders. So it's pretty clear that whatever we do here is not a totally trivial amount of work. So this is going to be pretty large, but it's also not so large that you're just like, OK, this is, this is, we should have done this differently from the outset, and there's just no way we can change this right now. So medium scale sort of effort. We looked a little bit at you know, how active that space is right now, because if you know, there's a ton of churn on it right now, then it's just harder to go in there and make changes. And the news there is pretty good. You can see that this has sort of calmed down a little bit over the years. Um, this is just monthly commits into the policy folder over the last couple of years. 
Um, you can also break this down a little bit by subdirectory and you see that, you know, sort of the updates there are mostly in, in protocols right now. And if you look at the actual commits, you also see that most of the work that's gone in there lately is actually just sort of modernization, stuff that needs sort of updating to keep going and so forth. So, so, so iteration on the actual features themselves is actually relatively little. So this too is basically good news. <clears throat> so the, the, the other big part to keep in mind is like, what will this affect? So if we go in there and start making changes, then what happens? And there are sort of four big areas where you, know, you, will, you will notice things. The first is of course, Zeek packages. So if you have Zeek packages out there today that rely on stuff in the policy folder, then that is a problem because those packages will have to adapt. And so like, today we have about, I think it's 147 um, packages in our standard distribution, the, the, the standard package source, I should say. And uh, if you look at how many of them actually use policy, the news is pretty good. It is 10. So it's really not a whole lot. So if we make changes, we don't affect a ton of packages. So that's really good news. Um, looking then at those packages, you can wonder, well, okay, so how much use of the policy folder do they make? Is there a really important package out there that basically uses a ton of it? And there too, the news is pretty good. There is not that much. There is one package that uses six you know, features in the policy folder and the others that just use a lot less. I don't know if you can guess what that is, but the winner is the Emojifier. Well done, Emojifier. So, <laughs> so this is really not so bad. We can clearly go in there and, and adapt these packages if necessary. A second big area is, of course, anybody actually tweaking local.zeek. So you know, anybody who's used to going into that local.zeek file and tweaking the add loads will now go over to ZKG and issue commands to load and unload um, packages, which is you know, like arguably better in, in, in our thinking, but um, clearly something that you would have to get used to and is a different workflow. <clears throat> then there's Zeek itself. So in particular, Zeek control, which is of course, you know, the way we maintain the cluster at the moment actually includes a couple of things from policy, but this is really just sort of three um, locations and we could clearly, you know, manage that, that change. Then there's testing and this is actually kind of interesting. So the B tests for the policy folder currently share a bunch of infrastructure. They share PCAP, some of the scripting, some of the tooling. Um, and we could install that with the Zeek distribution instead, which would also benefit any other Zeek packages that would like to do better testing. So that's that's pretty um, encouraging. So where is this right now? So we, we, we thought this is all pretty good news. We should prototype this a little bit. Um, and the idea at the moment is that we basically start bundling ZKG with the Zeek distribution itself, and then rely on its dependency mechanism to pull in a bunch of this content that currently sits in policy via packages. And since ZKG is pretty fully featured, you can sort of structure this pretty nicely via dependencies. You can say that there's this, this root package that just sort of governs a bunch of the content we want to provide out of the box and then via dependencies pulls in other packages. There is a bit of a catch with this idea and it is that that idea alone does not solve how strictly you want to structure these dependencies. And so you can think of this in at least two sort of dimensions. There is sort of what I call dependency looseness here. And this is basically about how strictly do you want to pin these packages to a given Zeek version? And the other dimension is how granular do you want to make those packages? So you can currently think of like literally anything in the policy folder being you know, its own individual package, or you could say, we just take all of that stuff in there and make it one giant um, package. So you have sort of these, these big sort of extremes. And if you look at this, in any amount of detail, you quickly realize like none of that is going to work. Like this is all basically too extreme. And so the answer is going to be somewhere in the middle there. And we will have to figure that out. That part is not entirely clear to me yet. Um, so one, one suggestion that comes to mind is we could start to align these packages along um, <clears throat> Zeek releases. So we could say for 3.2, you know, you have a certain versioning window during which we guarantee compatibility. Uh, and then when the next release rolls around, you move on to the next one and so forth. So um, I have a very quick demo for you guys. I, I realize um, I'm almost short on time, but I think I can do this pretty quickly. And just to show you guys what this looks like right now. So I have basically, this is just my machine at home and you know, this is sort of a clean slate. So if you know, I were to run Zeek or, or ZKG, it's, it's not there right now, um, but I have a build of Zeek 
Um, that has a bit of this functionality that I just showed you already built in. And so, you know, like if you look at the, the configure script for this one, you see that there's some stuff in here that, you know, is starting to support ZKG. Um, I've built this sort of, you know, in, in, uh, in preparation for this presentation and I can just install this at this point. I'll just have this run uh, through real quick um, or not so quick. <laughs> And you'll see sort of interesting stuff happening there too at the end of the installation, which is basically that it is pulling in both CKG and also some of those packages um, at installation time. <clears throat> Why is this so slow? All right, there we go. So um, at the end here, um, here's the bit where you know ZKG just got installed and we're about to get to the part where it pulls in the package dependencies. And this is pretty interesting because this is basically now using both um, versioning dependencies and sort of nested dependencies where we have this you know, root package that pulls in additional content. And so you know, I'll now, I, now, um, I now have uh, ZKG installed. And if I look at the packages that are there, you can see that there are three. And you know, if I if I ran ZKG on this right now, then you would see that those functionalities are there from the outset. But I think I'm running a little late, so I'm just going to go back to the slides real quick um, and just summarize a little bit. So so this is a first look at this. There is a bunch of stuff to figure out still. Um, you can follow along in this issue that I've linked here, where there's a bunch of discussion about this starting at the moment or developing at the moment. Um, and thoughts on this are really welcome. So, so if you are very experienced with a different kind of package manager, if you have sort of custom needs in your you know, installation that make you think this is a terrific idea or this is a terrible idea, then please let us know. Um, this is gonna be a transition. This will keep us busy for weeks to come, um, but um, we'll see, it's looking pretty exciting. There's one thing though that's clear, we're gonna need a lot of packages if we start working on this. And Working with a lot of packages, bootstrapping them is kind of hard at the moment. And this is where Vlad comes in and will tell you how templating can make all of that a lot better. So I'll stop sharing here and hand off to Vlad. Thanks, Christian. Um, as Christian mentioned, my name is Vlad Grigorescu. I'm at ESNet. Um, and I'll be talking in the second half of the presentation about um, a template that I've been working on for Zeek scripts and uh, something that we're looking to adopt to help out with this effort of packaging up the policy. Um, so uh, it's hard to believe that we've already had about uh, over four years of Zeek packages. Um, and uh, if you look at the, these are just the commits um, going into the repository. Uh, and, and it takes at least two commits to add a new package. And like Christian said, there's a little over 150 of them. But it's um, kind of neat to see that um, not, not only does this kind of happen uh, rather consistently, that we get contributions from the community with some peaks, as I imagine people rush to get stuff done for Zeek Week and then some dips in the summer. Um, and uh, while this has been really awesome to see, um, part of this work is really designed to uh, just make it easier for somebody who's never written a package before to get up and running. Um, if for those of you who have written packages, make it easier to maintain um, things as new Zeek versions come out and things change. And also provide a way for uh, maybe people that are new to the community to contribute um, without uh, kind of going as far as writing a new package. Um, so there's a cookie cutter template um, out there, uh, and I'll circle back to this at the end, but it uses um, two Python packages, the first one being cookie cutter, which basically just give it a directory structure, answer a few questions, and it'll go through and render out any templates that it finds in that directory structure. Um, unfortunately, the cookie cutter doesn't provide a way to update um, your package once the template gets updated, but another tool called cruft does that. So, 
to create a Zeek package, you need to pip install cruft and then run this cruft create command. It'll go out and get the latest version of the template, and they'll ask you a few questions. So on the left are the variables, um, and then on the right are the defaults that it has. Uh, some of those that are specific to me are in my uh, local configuration. Um, so the template also mentions how you can just go ahead and set some defaults for the packages that you create. So that if I want to create a new package, I need to answer three questions, basically. The name of it, the description, and the tags. And everything else is either a default value or is derived from those. So once I do that, um, I get this little welcome readme that walks me through a couple of the manual things that I need to do. I'm going to be hosting uh, my package on GitHub, so I need to create a repository for it. There's a little helper script to set up the branches for me. Um, I decidedly made actually pushing changes out to get a manual process. Um, and then there's an optional integration that um, you can enable. And once you're done, you can delete this file. So end up with something like this. This is a package that um, you may have seen on the mailing list yesterday. It's to detect the bad neighbor type of attacks. And you can see that um, there's a bunch of packages that it created. And in terms of um, helping to ensure the, re the reliability of the code, um, there's a lot of emphasis on continuous integration testing. So out of the box, it's running the B-test suite against Masker. Um, and against a bunch of other Zeek versions. Um, so kind of the current suite, um, I know a lot of people are still running 2.6. Um, and then the older ones uh, are in there as well. Not necessarily that we recommend people run those because of security and performance issues, but maybe there's a script that just happens to work on an older one and um, it's rather painless to support those users um, if you can. So something else that you get out of the box is documentation. So this is one of the one of the uh, policy pack one of the policy scripts that I packaged up, um, and this should look very similar to the Zeek documentation. Um, it uses the Zeek internal um, documentation generation to kind of go through and um, show you the the variables that might be of interest and um, the default values. Um, the other thing that's kind of neat is that this ties in with the actual Zeek documentation. So maybe you forgot what uh, the syntax for a table is. You can click on this, and it'll take you to the Zeek documentation for that. And it looks like I just lost my camera. So we will switch to that one. All right. Um, so it's great to emphasize these tests. It's nice to have the documentation. But we also wanted a measure to uh, see how effective the tests actually are. Um, so that's where this integration with coveralls comes in, where um, Zeek out of the box can, as you run the test suite, it has capabilities to tell you which lines in the script are actually being executed and how many times they get executed. So if I look at my main.zeek package here, now most of these lines, it deemed them not of interest. It only said that six of these lines were relevant. So the loads, the definitions, uh, the event handler, if statements, it doesn't really care about. All it cares about are these um, things that are actually calling out to other code. This is something that maybe will extend down the line. But so you can see that the test suite, um, there are two attacks here that should be getting detected. Um, and really, we only have uh, a packet capture that can reliably trigger one of them. So. We are running a test against this, but if I look at um, what's actually getting reported in the repository, it's only saying that I have 50% coverage because I'm only walking through the code and actually testing one of these. Um, Doc's actually been working on triggering the other one, but it's possible that we found a bug in the ICMP parsing of Zeek and that it might not even be, uh, we might have a tough time actually reliably detecting this. Even. So um, another good thing that kind of comes out of this level of analysis that uh, we can kind of test um, how good of a job we're doing. Um, another check that you get is whether or not you're actually running the latest version of the template. Um, so you might see this at the top, and then you just run a cruft update. Um, it asks you if you want to view the changes or just apply them. And then if you need them, it uses the git tooling to show you a diff and kind of ask you what you want to do about that. So um, it 
pull down the template, re-rendered it, uh, compared it to the old version that it had, and it noticed that I had messed up the link to the coveralls repository on the badge, and it is prompting me to go ahead and update that. Uh, so I can go ahead and update that. It tells me that everything's good, and now that build should pass. Um, there's a few other features kind of hidden around in here. Um, you just heard about Vern's uh, script optimization branch, and one of the things that that branch can do is flag potential usage errors. So maybe there's an optional field, and you're accessing it before you check to see if that field is set. Um, if you actually uh, hit that line while you're running Zeek, you'll get a reporter warning. Um, but um, there is a CI test that will uh, use Vern's branch to try to flag any of those. So if there's any usage errors at all, that test would fail and it would kind of show you where those things are to try to fix those. Um, there are a couple of things just to help with testing. There's a, um, sometimes testing things like GOIP uh, based detections is hard because you're now modifying your PCAP to put in an IP address from a country that you care about. Um, so I've been exploring the idea of kind of having these mock functions where um, like other uh, testing suites might have. Uh, a couple of things for just, um, running a test selectively based on the version that's the Zeek version. Um, one of the files that gets generated is uh, an editor configuration file where all of these editors out of the box will read this file and you'll get um, a consistent, you'll get uh, white space and tab handling that lines up with what, with how the Zeek scripts are written on the core. Um, you can install a plugin to kind of get that same behavior in these editors. Um, it follows some of the GitHub community best practices. Um, so things like a, con a, a contribution guideline that um, walks you through how to um, get involved in a project that you care about from just uh, throwing a thumbs up on an issue that you're also that also affects you to ideally contributing things like PCAPs and tests to try to bump up that those coverage numbers to make sure that we're actually um, doing a good job of testing these things. Um, there is also support for GitLab CI. Um, this thought being that um, if maybe you have a detection that you're not really ready to release yet or don't want to put up on GitHub or a private PCAP, um, you might have a self-hosted GitLab instance and you can go ahead and um, run all your stuff there. Um, so this is currently in uh, beta. Um, there, I've been using it on some ESNet packages and personal packages for a few months now. Um, and um, like I said, it's something that we're um, looking at, uh, kind of figuring out how we need to adopt and what portions we can use for the policy packages. Um, there is currently a bug in Cruft where um, if the template uh, deletes a file or in some cases adds a new file, you might not get that with the update. But if you're willing to copy over the um, occasional file, then um, it should just work for generating packages and then keeping them up to date. Um, we will be hanging around in the Slack channel, and we're happy to take your questions. And thank you for your time. <laughs>